meeting, I'll call the meeting to order. It's seven o'clock. And uh, for those of you who wish to speak at a, at some point in time, I'll ask you to demask in order to be able for us to be able to, to hear you. And if you um, wish to come to the microphone, that would be very helpful to, uh, to us as well. So the uh, first thing on our agenda uh, are the minutes of July 27th, 2021. Is there a motion? We accept the minutes subject to modification. Is there a second? I'll second. Page one. Page two. And page three. Carry on page three under item number nine, uh, Taft's Corners form based code vision plan. The very last sentence didn't make sense to me. Also, the Baroque community on the hill. And I wonder if, if he meant to say Burr Oak, B U R R space O A K. Uh, I have no idea what it means either, but Mr. Sundacall was the person who made the statement. Okay. Yeah. But so. the Baroque community. <laughs> so. Perhaps we can. Uh, have... I, I'm not saying I know Williston as well as many <laughs> others do, but I never knew there was a Baroque community uh, uh, in Williston. Me too. Uh, <laughs> Apparently, that's what our recording secretary got from his okay. comments. <laughs> and perhaps it's, uh, <laughs> we can check with her yeah. regarding the, uh, the statement yeah. or check the tape. Okay. Anything else on page three? If not, then all those in favor of approving the minutes of July 27, 2021, say aye. 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 Three ayes. Have it. There are no negative votes. So um, we'll move on then to public comment. Is there anyone in the room who wishes to wake, make any public comment on any topic tonight? If you would just please identify yourself. Please. Uh, my name is Jasper Wood. You can take your mask off so we can hear you. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Jasper Wood. Welcome. My name is Jasper Wood. I'm 14 years old. Williston needs to hire a town energy coordinator, and this is why. In the past few weeks, the air quality has been so poor, there were days I've been advised to stay inside and not go out and play with my friends. This is due to a warming climate and the effects of wildfires out west and in Canada. Without fresh air to breathe, what do we have left? This is a sign that things are getting worse at a rapid rate. We need to act fast, and we need to act now. The UN IPCC report states that the planet is in dire shape. We can no longer wait. We need to do something. We need to reduce emissions and sequester carbon and carry out the town plan. It is my generation that will be dealing with the worst effects of climate change, such as increased natural disasters, mass extinctions, sea level rise, worsening air quality, and lack of clean water. You have a responsibility to my generation, and you have the power to do something about it. You know what you need to do. Be on the right side of history. Do the right thing. Thank you for representing me. I'd like to submit this. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment from people in the audience? My name is Brian Forrest. Uh, um, I just have a couple of questions. One is uh, last month's meeting, there was uh, the consideration of the uh, of an energy committee was kicked uh, to September sometime. Is there any clarification on which meeting in September that will be taken up? And will they also, the board also be considering uh, funding a uh, full-time energy coordinator? 
our plan is at this point to come up with a plan uh, to for the public to look at, for the board to look at. Uh, I think not by mid September, the uh, the funding acquisition would be a budgetary issue, and then we'd be discussing that during the uh, the budget uh, sessions that we have. That will be discussed during the during the budget sessions you have. I'm sure that you folks will want us to discuss that uh, during the budgetary session. And, and Terry, just to be clear, if we talk about during the budgetary session, that would be to be included in the fiscal year 23. In the budget. fiscal year, that's correct. Okay. Any further public comment on any topic tonight from the people in the audience? Yes. Uh, I'm Reed Parker. I was on the uh, Energy Task Force over the past couple of years. I want to thank this young man for his presentation and uh, uh, fully support his position that we do need an energy coordinator in the town. Thank you. Is there anyone on the, uh, the Zoom Connect uh, that wishes to speak? Uh, nope, Terry. Just have someone um, monitoring for their uh, community merit badge from uh, Troop. Six ninety two. No one to make a public comment. If there is no other person wishing to make any public comment, we're ready to move on to the next issue. Seeing no hands raised, we'll move on then to interviews and appointments. And uh, we're looking at uh, two different uh, things tonight. One for the historical and architectural advisory committee, and secondly the catamount. Community Forest Committee. Uh, so our first person, uh, the one candidate we have for the the Hack Committee is Alex Pintair. Alex, you join us. Welcome to uh, the select board meeting, and, and um, we do have your uh, resume in front of us. But uh, if you would just give us a and the, the folks listening in, um, a brief description of your background and why you wish to be on the, the HAC Commission. Sure, I've been a Williston res resident for about 21 years. Um, I've built a couple of homes in Williston, uh, most recently one here in the village. Um, that process took about seven years due to some um, problems with the neighbors. So it really gave me a, a pretty good education into the process um, of what happens uh, as far as in the village and development. And this seemed like a great opportunity to give back to the community. Thank you. Um, questions from the board? I have a question that may be considered irrelevant. I apologize. Uh, but is that the, the Lampman house that you renovated? Yeah. That's the or Dr. John Lampman? Yep. Yeah. OK. He, um, he was my doctor. Uh, and oh, wow. as a small small child, I have a recollection of being in your house, being treated by him. Amazing. Um, and uh, uh, so there there have been there have been lots of people getting physical exams in your house. Yeah, was, it, he was. A I don't know what that community. does for you. But <laughs> I, uh, yeah. But, well, we uh, we actually we we renovated that house and then sold it. It's now Ridgeline Real Estate, and we we, we built the duplex that's now okay. behind there where the horse barn was. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, that's that's my uh, that's my line of inquiry for today. <laughs> um, so so um, my question has to do with um, how do you how do you how do you view the process that uh, let's say a developer or or somebody trying to do what you tried to do renovate a home yep. convert a barn into a duplex how is the process is it a good process bad process does it need a lot of work. I think fundamentally it's a good process. I think Williston has done more than a lot of towns to really lay down some laws that everyone needs to adhere to in order to create anything that's new in the village to represent, to, to have it sync with what's already here. Um, and I think that's great. I think there's some improvements that could be had because the Route 2 corridor, which is the historic area, is, is pretty... Um, you know, the, the visibility, like like our building, for example, is 300 feet back. You you really can't see it from Route 2, whereas, but we still had to sort of go through all the historic laws. Um, I think that could be looked at and maybe, maybe considered a little bit different because I know there are other 
deep lots in the village that sort of go back a ways that if somebody were to try to develop that in the future, maybe they don't need to have the wood siding or the, you know, the real you know, true divide windows, that sort of thing. Um, but I was just honestly, as frustrating as the process was to take so long, it was fascinating for me personally, just to see how the process worked. Um, and that's why I'm here. Okay. All right, good, thank you. My, my next question um, is, is a question that for some reason has fallen on me to ask. Okay. And it's asked of virtually every person who sure. is sat in that uh, uh, chair you're in. You yeah. mentioned um, you built a couple homes. Yep. It sounds like you could build uh, other homes. So, uh, so my question is a conflict of interest question, sure. and it's what, um, how would you recognize it and what would you do about it? if you were sitting on the committee? Yeah, I mean, I don't anticipate doing another development project in the village. Um, if one day for some reason that were to happen, I think the usual process, like I know Scott Riley is on the DRB, just recuses himself and, and that seems pretty simple. Okay, all right, good, thank you. Yeah. Any further questions? No. Um, if we're ready to appoint tonight, there are some motions to get to. I'd move to appoint Alex Pintera to the Historical and Architectural Advisory Committee for an, the un unexpired three-year term through June 30, 2024. Is there a second? No second. Is there a discussion on the motion? No, I, a perspective I think would be helpful. If there's no further discussion then, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Three ayes have it. Congratulations and thanks for your willing to serve. Absolutely, thank you. Good night. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And next we have candidates for the uh, Catamount Community Forest Committees. Uh, we had uh, three to begin with, two, one has withdrawn. So Reed Parker and David Saladino would approach. And I'm not sure if you want to sit together, but there's a microphone over here too as well. And Terry, if you don't mind, before we interview, um, as you may remember, I am a member of the committee they are applying for and the select board representative on that. And I don't feel comfortable at participating in choosing the, the member because a, a committee member shouldn't probably shouldn't choose those who are on uh, are going to be on that committee. So I realize tonight that, that uh, it is an issue with there's only two select board members uh, who possibly could vote if I do choose to recluse myself. So. I don't know if that's an issue or if we can put it off till the next meeting. Both. Well, we I think the, since we have our candidates here and the people, who, the simple select board members who are not here tonight, that's true. And watch this um, on rebroadcast that we can do the interviews tonight. To not, okay. Uh, not have to have them come back a second time. Yeah. And uh, we'll postpone the um, the nomination or the the appointments until uh, we have a full full board. Great, thank you. And the other piece is, is there any sense in me participating in the in the interviews, but not in the selection process itself? I think it uh, would be very helpful yeah. since you're a member of the okay. committee that you know, hopefully, the right question to ask. Okay, <laughs> great, thank you. So I, I, I'm, I apologize, I lost track of which one of you gentlemen is which. I'm sorry. I'm Reed Parker. David oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, these, these things I do. So the same uh, situation, we'll, we'll follow the same protocol as we did before. We'll ask you both to weigh in and say, give us a brief background um, of yourselves, even though we do have your applications in front of us, and then uh, a, a good reason as to why you'd like to be on the uh, the Catamount Community Forest Committee. Then we'll open up questions to the board. So, Reed, I have you to start first on my list. So. Good evening. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, I've been a resident five years here in Boston, previously in Essex. Uh, I was on the uh, Energy Task Force for its inspiration to put together the, uh, the energy plan that was presented to the Select Board um, a year or so ago. Uh, this, I've used Catamount as for my own recreation, um, cross-country skiing, hiking, most recently birding with my wife who was on the uh, nesting committee and when this opening came up i started looking into it uh read through the the plans put together by the county forester and the, the town itself and found that it's it's much broader and more interesting than i thought when it first 
first take is it's a you know a biking recreation area, but there's a lot to it. There's a, the forestry management aspect, the wildlife management, the recreation, the lumbering, and I thought this is a really well put together plan. I'm looking to expand my participation with the town, and I thought this would be a, a committee I would like to work in because I also use the area. Uh, I took my grandchildren hiking up through there this year. Um, you know, we go through the trails, check out the birds, and um, it just seems like a very interesting committee to work on. Yeah, thank you. Dave? Thank you. Uh, so Dave Saladino, um, I've been in Williston probably uh, six years, six or seven years. Um, uh, serve on the Development Review Board for about five of those years. Uh, serve on a couple other boards in a professional capacity. Um, uh, the Consulting Engineering Corporation uh, uh, Board of Directors and uh, Institute of Transportation Engineers Board. Uh, both very thrilling boards to be on. Uh, I can I can vouch for that. Um, <clears throat> so familiar with kind of kind of the board interactions and, and discussions. Um, background is a civil engineer, a professional licensed civil engineer. Um, and probably the most most uh, germane piece here is uh, it moved recently, well, three years ago, up to uh, just out, off of Catamount. Uh, so Jeff, I think I'm. I think we're technically neighbors. I, I live up the hill in the Blue House. Okay. Here. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just just off the grounds of Catamount. So in those three years, I've just had um, uh, lots of opportunity to get out and explore, and um, and then reading through the the forest management plan, and and just being able to kind of see how uh, you you manage the growth and evolution of woods and forest and and kind of watching and watching that evolution seeing some of the historic photos has um, been very enlightening very interesting to just understand it, very selfishly kind of where I live you know kind of what is the history of that that piece of land and, and it's been it's been very intriguing very interesting and um, would love to uh, have an opportunity to give back um, I, I would say I, I do have um, quite a lot, of, a lot of other things on my plate and so I read sounds very well qualified and so if it's if at the end of the day if it's a toss up I'd be happy to defer in this in this um, instance and um, look for an, an opportunity where the next seat opens up. Um, so I, I just put that out there. I'm still very interested in serving on the board, but if you you know if if we're equally uh, well qualified, I'm happy to uh, to step aside for this. Thank you very much. Um, questions from the board. Um, I'm going to ask a similar question to both candidates. Um, read your application and uh, uh, statement to you were in the Winooski Valley Conservation District. Um, uh, were you a, what was your position? That, that was a volunteer position. Okay. That's where they, they send out notices and say, hey, we're planting 700 trees today. And you think that's insurmountable, but it's really done well with a lot of people. So I've done some here in Williston. I've done some in other parts of the Winooski Valley. Uh, so that hasn't been on a board position by any means I was shovel in hand planting trees and it's, that's, it's a great thing to do. That's good too. Um, what about the energy uh, task force? Um, the energy task force, uh, I was one of the members, uh, Brian I think is left, uh, Brian Forrest and uh, he left the room, but uh, we put together that whole plan uh, with the Chittenden County Planning Commission, went through all of the, you know, what the permutations of that of putting together a energy plan that met state, state standards. Um, it was, that was a real challenge. I think there was a lot of learning that went on there because we were taking that from the ground up we're in a town that didn't have an energy committee prior, uh, you know, and uh, uh, so a number of us that worked on that and worked with professionals from the, the county, uh, other folks who came in, I found it was a, a very interesting project. Um, and as I spoke, when it was first surfaced earlier in this meeting, I would like to see an energy committee and a coordinator go forth with the town. With the town. Um, David, similar question. Um, your board experiences, um, could you describe those and um, uh, how any skills that you've developed or honed on those would apply to this position? Um, surviving long meetings, I think, is what it's one. <laughs> you know, finding ways to find interest. No, uh, I, I really enjoyed my time on the development review board. Um, uh, you know, I think it, it provides an opportunity to weigh in and kind of um, uh, uh, employ my practice. You know, and be able to look at you know development review, look at engineering plans, and help craft the best development that we can for Williston. So that that it feels rewarding, and um, you know, it's I think it's a um, 
a really great board. I think the board operates very, you know, it's a, a well-functioning board. So that, that um, has been very good. Uh, the other two I serve, I'm currently vice president on both of the boards of transportation engineers and consulting engineers. Um, and uh, those, you know, it, it, uh, we have subcommittees, so it's staffing the subcommittees, it's, you know, preparing and reviewing minutes, it's kind of the typical routine um, uh, activities. And, and then in, in my, you know, nine to five world as an engineer, a lot of work that I do is presenting to boards uh, as we do uh, planning studies, so a traffic calming study or a, a roundabout design or something, we usually typically will go before a select board or a planning commission. And so in that role, I'm fairly familiar with kind of the interactions with, with various boards. Thank you. Okay. This, this question is for both of you. Um, don't have a preference which one goes first. Uh, the question is some of the ideas that might be presented to the committee um, for consideration uh, might be controversial. Uh, for instance, um, allowing dogs at, at the community forest uh, or horses or um, maybe limiting one of the current uses. So my question is, is if that were to, to happen, what would your approach be uh, to deal with that issue? Question makes sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, in fact, I, in reading through, uh, I attended the meeting last month via Zoom, so, um, um, and some of these things were discussed, and I understand people with dogs. I'm a dog owner. I like to take them through the woods, and you know, some, a lot of people in the town might be interested in that. I hadn't even really considered horses, but certainly there are trails there. Those are things that you have to weigh for what is the, the greater good of the plan for the town for this, for, for the um, Catamount Forest. Uh, and really look to you, say, are there other opportunities for dog walking, for horse riding, and those kinds of things, or does it make sense? So you really can't just say, I have an opinion today because honestly, I, I don't one way or the other. Uh, uh, and it really has to take in public comment, um, looking at what the plan is for the town that's been written. And does it make sense to amend that to say, oh, dogs are allowed, but on a leash or horses are allowed during certain times of the year. Um, and you just have to look at all those options and make a recommendation. It was very well said. Um, you know, I would I would concur with with all of that. I I, I think um, I would also you know check my biases at the door and 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 try not to bring those to the decisions and really try to keep an open mind and and try to reach an objective decision as as well as possible to to the point that was already made. You know, looking at weighing the pros and cons. What are the that human and health issues, environmental uh, issues with you know uh, droppings that don't get picked up, right? What yeah. what are, what are the costs versus Opportunities to increase, um, you know, attendance and, and use of the of the facility. So I think it, as objective as possible. I think as an engineer, you know, that's kind of how I like to look at things. So look at kind of what the real the pros and cons are. Yeah. Okay. And then my next question is, um, and it, and it isn't necessarily a, a question, um, more just to feel out how you how you might approach this. And what it is is right now. You have the Catamount Community Forest that the town owns, and then there is a license agreement with a nonprofit, the Catamount Outdoor Family Center. And I guess my question is, is do you have any thoughts on that sort of a relationship, the license agreement relationship with a nonprofit who is continuing to provide uses of the land that are I mean, historic, I guess, is a way to put that. Um, I don't really know where that question is going, but it's, I think it's a very unique aspect of the Catamount Community Forest and, you know, one that unique and, and important, maybe that's a way to put it, and thus the question. I think it's a, it's a, a very valid way to maintain the rec recreation. I assume this nonprofit is for the recreational side of of using the forest. And uh, yeah. it, it gives the town control because you have to have a written agreement that says what should they do, what shouldn't they do, what are their plans to advance recreation in there. But alleviates the town of that management side of it. And it being a nonprofit, 
um, I think that that's probably for the benefit of the recreation area as opposed to a for-profit. We don't want to turn Catamount into Disney World. And so, um, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's, a, it's a great place. I biked not on the trails, but on the road there, the Chittenden Road there and um, over the hill. And you just see all those kids on those bikes this summer. And it's, you know, it's t- tremendous to see that activity. And if you've got a well-organized nonprofit group running that and coming to us and saying, oh, but we'd like to change this trail. Does that fit into the plan? Well, then that's a good question. And having them make those recommendations, manage that whole recreational piece, I, I think is a good a, a good place for the town to be right now. Okay. I guess the only piece, and just picking up on the last piece, I think having that feedback mechanism or the kind of the loop where the, the, the nonprofit, the um, outdoor center can be providing feedback back to the, to the committee so that um, the missions stay aligned and so that, you know, the, the, or, or ideas that come up during some of the bike classes during the day that they can, or, or, or feedback that they're hearing from some of the pe- people who are coming to visit, uh, get feedback into the overarching back to, back to you, back to the town and, and kind of the overarching management committee so that, um, those can stay aligned. Okay. And th- I promise this will be my second to last question <laughs> <laughs> before the last one I always get to ask is, um, a couple of times this winter, we walk the road a lot. We walk by your house quite a bit. By the way, nice job with the yard. Thank you. Uh, Thank um, you. And there were a couple of times where the parking lot was full. In fact, it was so full, people were parking on the road. So my question is, good problem, bad problem? A uh, good problem, because it's probably <laughs> not all the time. You know, this, this, like this summer, right, there was lots of times the parking lot had a lot of people in it. but occasionally you see other cars on the road but i think that's other distance bikers who are just parking their car taking their bike off and maybe riding through mountain view and other places um if it's 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 something you have to address if it becomes problematic and is occurring so many times but you can't plan for the maximum parking lot if i think the in reading through it it holds 90 cars and if you had 110 a couple of days or a few days, that's in my mind acceptable. If you found it happening 30 or 40 or 50 days, you have to readdress how big is our parking lot? Do we do we limit capacity, you know, uh, attendance, which is probably a bad thing. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and it's, it's like any other public event. Um, I went to the antique car show in Waterbury. Bars Field was so crowded this weekend. Thousands and thousands of people just having a good time. And yet, most weekends at the flea markets there, it's much less attended. So uh, I, I think you just have to try and look at it and say, how often does that happen? Do we, how much do we have to address it? It's not the kind of road where parking on the edge is going to cause major traffic jams. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, you know, it is it is a good problem, but I, I think it is a problem nonetheless. And, you know, seeing some of those, particularly on the kind of the race days, when people who are unfamiliar with the area have, have watched them out, out front of my house, you know, they'll park on the side of the road and they'll get out of their car and there's very little room and there's cars flying by. And it, it, there's I've definitely seen many um, near misses with people kind of darting out between cars and, you know, they're tightly packed in. And I think there's an opportunity to potentially look at some overflow parking locations um, several come to mind, but you know, looking at in those cases, or if there's a big event or a race that that's happening, having some shuttle service or something from a remote location. Um, certainly, on on a given day, if there's a few cars, um, it works, and there's not a lot of traffic. But I think on those on those real peak days, it would be ideal to have some kind of satellite or off off or nearby location where it can park. All right, good, thank you. And then my last question is the conflict of interest question. I assume you heard it. Uh, before, you know, if there was a conflict of interest, how would you recognize it? What would you do about it? Well, I don't see that I have one right now. <laughs> but that, it's but hard no, to no, it's that... just as, you know, you, you, you raised the question of recusing yourself from the voting on this, this, these appointments. Yeah. Um, it's something that you certainly, being on a committee, you have to be aware of. If something came up and I was financially involved with a proposal for there or or even became involved with the nonprofit that's running there, I, I would have to address that with the committee and with the board. Good, thank you. 
and yeah, similar. And you know, being on the development review board, being an engineer, those yeah. those conflicts do come up. So I'm uh, fairly you know comfortable with that, with recusing myself, and would would be happy to do that if that that came up okay. on, on this board. Good, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions from the board? I have a question, uh, Jeff. So as you are on the committee, and uh, and you have a really well put together plan that's been adopted yeah. by the town and the ownership and everything. And and reading through it, where do you see the committee going? What are its next steps? You know, what is it looking to do? Why should, why should I join? What is, what is the challenge that, that I would be faced with? Boy, great question, Danielle. Can, can you help? <laughs> Danielle's also on the committee. Um, you know, that's a great question because it's still relatively new. Mm -hmm. So I think um, in, in, in a sense, we are still feeling our way. Uh, but we have some, you know, some of the major pieces behind us, uh, the, the plan, um, Ethan Trapper and coming up with a forest management plan. Uh, so hopefully we're starting to get into more of a, a status quo and we can start to address some of the more nuanced type questions, such as maintenance of the parking area and what's the town role in that and, and that type of thing. But Danielle, you've been on a little bit longer than I joined. I'm not the original select board member who was appointed to it. So I would love to hear your thoughts. That is a good question. We have, I feel like we have an overarching plan mm -hmm. and our, now we have to figure out how to actually achieve it. Yeah. We're still trying to figure out how to take care of the amazing species that yeah. we know are there, but how are we going to get to the species? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Are we going to get that goal or is this what we're going to do? Because we're in the, we're in the means right now. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and, and reading through the forest plan, I did notice that. And I, listening to Ethan last month um, about that invasive species, that didn't, didn't even occur to me. You know, it's a forest. Yeah. And suddenly you recognize that there are things to be done. So thank you. Sure. Any further questions of us from the, the candidates? If not, then um, we'll revisit the, the uh, appointment in our next meeting in September. And uh, thanks both of you for coming tonight and being willing to serve on this uh, great committee. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now we're moving on to the um, animal trapping policy discussion, and uh, this is uh, something that we started quite some time ago to discuss, and tonight is the first of a couple of meetings that we'll be having to uh, get some more information from um, various uh, places that are uh, have a, uh, an interest in this, and tonight we'll be dealing with the um, representative from the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife. But before we do that, I'll ask Eric to lead us into uh, where we're at tonight. Yep. Thanks, Terry. And you, you hit some of my points here in your, in your brief introduction here. Just a reminder for folks watch, watching at home as well and in the room, the select board started a, had an initial discussion on this topic last winter. Um, there was a petition from community members asking the town to consider a ban on trapping on, on town property. And as uh, per Vermont law, a landowner has discretion whether to allow trapping to occur on their property. And the town's never considered what, if any, trapping um, to allow on public lands as the property owner situation. And currently, uh, our conservation planner uh, receives a couple of phone calls a year uh, asking about trapping. There's a number of instances for trapping to consider, including sport wildlife management. So we have uh, Kim Royer here tonight uh, for a presentation. She's a wildlife biologist from the state of Vermont. Um, and as Terry mentioned, uh, another, a couple of other groups have contacted the town to speak to the board on this, on this topic. Um, and staff would look for any additional information or questions the board has tonight to help prepare for those other um, discussions at future meetings here. So I think I'm all set. Uh, Kim, we could get you connected here. And, uh, Please come up right up to the table here with the microphone. Okay. And I that, think I've just got to get you on the wire. And that does not broadcast uh, uh, sound to us. So if you just speak loudly, you can demask and, and speak to us. Okay, terrific. Hmm. Is there a computer in if there's a plug plug Let me let me give it a shot. Yeah. Hmm? 
Um, should we'll I? Get a yeah, I'll let you. Technology can help regulate. Yes. Brave new world. <laughs> yeah. Thankful still... I can get through it if I can. <laughs> did, did you see that? I did. I'm. I'm. It's oh. logging on. I hope. What I'll do is I'll make you a panelist, then you'll be able to just share your screen. Then it will come up on that screen for the board and for folks watching. Okay. Great. If all goes according to plan. Oh, I have to enter my email. Thanks. We did it. Oop, I see you. All right. So it'll be a panel. Okay. So I can now. Let me just. It's going to ask you if you want to become a panelist. And... Oh, it is. It's out now. It says rejoining. Okay. Yep. Now you're coming as a panelist. Do I need to start start the video? Nope. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. You want to come move into my office with me? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, well, thank you. I apologize for the delay, but. Um, Appreciate you inviting me to speak, and um, I'll speak rather quickly because this is a pretty nuanced topic that's hard to do in short sound bites, as you'll see. And um, I, I really uh, found your topic really interesting that you were just talking about, and I'll, I'll sort of get into that a little bit. So let me just put this on. Um, this I can't. Let's just see if I can get. There we go. I'll put it on. There we go. Okay. So uh, I just usually start with the department mission, uh, which is the conservation of fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for the people of, the, of Vermont. And the reason why I start with this is because this is what motivates us. This is what motivates our staff. Um, this is what's motivated me for almost 40 years and why I'm still doing what I do, because um, it's important to me that my grandchildren have access to the same species and and forests that, that I've been lucky enough to, to have um, at my disposal here in Vermont. But a lot of people think of the conservation of fish, wildlife, and plants and their habitats as the iconic species like bear and deer and bobcat. Um, but there's really over 25,000 species that we're responsible for. 
which is a, a daunting task um, and, and something that um, goes from, the, like I said, the iconic wildlife species, but invertebrates, all the invertebrates, natural communities, plants, and the habitats for all of those species um, that depend on those. So we do a lot of habitat work um, rather than um, specific species type work because that's, that's how you protect the species is by protecting the stage. Um, but unique to North America, who owns wildlife? Um, we do. You folks, our public owns wildlife. And in, as you most know, as you probably know, in North in Europe, that's not the case. The landowner owns wildlife, um, and it's very important. I mean, we're the trustees. The Fish and Wildlife Department, our board, are the trustees of these species, and we're responsible for managing sustainable populations for future generations. Um, and again, like I said, we take that task very seriously. Um, what we have found, and what I can say um, after 40 years of doing this is that people tend to really love wildlife until that bear is on their back porch, the skunks under their, their deck, uh, the woodchucks in their garden, uh, the moose is cutting, you know, is breaking down the sap lines, the beavers flooding their driveway, and then, you know, they want somebody to take care of it. And, and our goal is not only to maintain populations into the future, but to maintain public support for wildlife into the future. Because without that public support, we can't really protect the habitat. Um, so why would a conservation organization whose role is to protect wildlife species and conserve wildlife species for future generations still support regulated trapping? Um, and there's more reasons than the ones I'm going to go through here, but these are really the sort of the management dri driving reasons. Um, and the first one is that uh, population management, and I don't want to overstate this one, um, not every not every wildlife population has to be managed, but there are some that benefit um, from management and some that actually benefit from localized management and, and beaver and muskrat are two that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, habitat protection, this is particularly the true in um, places like along the coast of um, Louisiana and even up now in Chesapeake Bay where nutria, an introduced species, has basically eaten out all the wetlands along the coast and um, created real, real increased problems when, when there's um, hurricanes and, and tropical storms that hit the coast because those wetlands have been decimated by nutria. And so um, actually the only thing that we have found to help control that population is, is trapping. Other things have been tried, but that's the only thing that works. Uh, reducing human wildlife conflict. That's certainly something that we usually try on uh, non-invasive methods first. Um, in fact, we almost always do, but they don't always work. Um, and so this is one tool that we have for dealing with a coyote that's either become habituated and is starting to um, attack domestic dogs, which, which happens quite regularly in other states. Massachusetts, I just got some emails um, in the last few weeks from them that they basically have a dog attack almost on a daily basis. Um, and they don't have trapping, um, so they have no tool for dealing with that. So often those coyotes, you know, are, there's no way to control those coyotes in these suburban areas. Um, firearm discharge is not allowed there. So uh, it, being able to get at the offending animal is pretty critical. Protection of endangered species, our non-game program actually hires trappers to, um, this is a spiny soft shell turtle. The, the non-game program actually hires trappers to control raccoon fox populations that are decimating turtle nests along Lake Champlain. Reintroduction of threatened and endangered species. We have hired trappers many times to help us reintroduce. The, the fisher was reintroduced from Maine. We, we purchased fish, uh, fisher from trappers in Maine. The, the American Martin was reintroduced in 89, 90, and 91. I was part of that reintroduction effort, and we purchased uh, Martins from Maine and New York and released 118 of them into the Southern Green Mountain National Forest, which actually I thought was a failure, but recently have found out that it's we at least have a reproducing population. Um, beaver were, were trapped, live trapped 
in the 1920s and 30s and then brought into Vermont to reestablish that population. So an important tool for that as well. And research and monitoring, we've had a, a, a few uh, studies. We did a, a coyote study in the 1980s where uh, trappers helped us to trap coyotes with foothold traps, same traps that they continue to use today, only more improved. And uh, trappers actually helped us in a, on a bobcat study in um, this region, in the Champlain Valley in the 2000s. Uh, trappers actually captured cats with both box traps and with foothold traps. And then we collared them and followed them around for four months to, to determine critical habitats. So a lot of people, as are we, are concerned about the impacts that trapping could have on endangered species. Um, and none of the animals, I think it's really important to state that none of the animals that have a legal trapping season right now are at risk at all. In fact, many of them are more common than they were 100 years ago. Fisher, obviously beaver, coyote, opossum. Um, most of those species were almost extirpa extirpated. Of course, coyote didn't come in until the 40s and 50s anyway. But um, and some are more abundant than they were prior to European settlement. Bobcat, probably the red fox, raccoon, those species that um, can deal with human changes and to the landscape um, are doing very well. Uh, we actually worked with trappers to rewrite laws up in the Northeast Kingdom when we had a surge in the lynx population to try to minimize the, the potential for take of lynx. And they also can be our eyes and ears on the ground. Um, that Martin, that Martin reintroduction that I told you about, we thought had failed until a trapper who was fisher trapping in the Southern Greens saw Martin tracks, and instead of putting out a trap, put up a camera, and uh, he sent us this video. And this actually, uh, we actually started to put out camera boxes down there. We've had camera boxes out. We just concluded several studies with Southern Connecticut State University. Um, to try to determine occupancy of Martin in the Southern Greens and have found core habitats for Martin. So uh, we would not have probably known this without, at least not at this point in time, without that information. Animal welfare, I think, is the biggest concern for most people, um, as it is and has been for wildlife biologists for decades. Um, and so about 20 years ago, uh, we began this process uh, called developing the best management practices for trapping. And it was it's actually an international process um, based on international standards that were developed by Canada, Russia, and the European Union. And uh, this is probably the largest trap testing study that's ever gone on in the United States. 41 states participated, including Vermont, for 10 years. We had trapper teams, a trapper and a field observer who was to make sure that the trapper followed the protocols, took the notes. We sent the notes into a centralized location. And the, the point was to develop traps that were better than the traps that a lot of people think um, about. I mean, the, the old tooth trap, that's banned in Vermont, has been for, for decades. Um, so the point of these was develop, develop these best management practices um, this is the one for beaver. So there's there's one for every species. Um, and we were looking at animal welfare primarily. We wanted, we wanted them to meet certain standards for animal welfare, but also efficiency, selectivity, practicability, and safety. And the goal was to create different types of trap designs. They look similar to the old design, but they often have padded jaws or laminated jaws or offset jaws that, that make them meet these, these animal welfare standards. They have swivels, they have pan tension that help meet selectivity requirements. Um, so there's just pages of information about what types of traps pass. And we're working on converting trappers through education of both the trappers and the manufacturers. So manufacturers are starting to create these type of trapping systems. Selectivity is also a concern about from a lot of people, as it is for us. We don't want threatened and endangered species being caught in these traps. Um, and as part of this study, and we try to base our information on science. Um, it's always not perfect science, but we try to base it on the best science that we have. And this is the best science that we have. And in a quarter of a million trap sets on this, in this trapping study, um, no threatened or endangered species were captured. 
Uh, New Hampshire actually was part of this process and they, they trapped, um, they tested beaver, uh, beaver traps, and uh, the traps were checked 544 times. They captured mostly beaver, but also three muskrat and one raccoon. So really very high selectivity. Um, and in Louisiana, where they were trapping for nutria, um, they, they, were, they trapped 957 nutria and four raccoons, one opossum, and unfortunately four rabbits, three birds, and one domestic dog who was released unharmed. So there was some incidental take there, but very, very low compared to the numbers of trap nights that were out there. Um, human and pet safety, again, a concern for everybody. Um, new trappers must take trapper education in Vermont. It's a requirement. During this trap testing study, no dogs or cats were caught 99.95% of the time. And uh, that's after a quarter of a million trap checks. Those, those that were, were all released unharmed except for two feral cats. Um, and trapping is highly regulated. There's upwards of 42 different regulations that address uh, trapping. And so there are people that don't follow those regulations. I think you had an incident here in town. Um, we have wardens who try to take care of those situations. Many of the, the cases where we have problems, it's with people who are, have not been through trapper education, don't have a license, they're not trappers. They're people who are using um, these, these tools in ways that they're not supposed to be used. Um, so just quickly, I'm gonna go through a case study um, that um, this, was, this was done in Massachusetts. Some well-meaning people wanted to ban trapping in Massachusetts back in the 1990s. Uh, in Massachusetts, they have referendums. Uh, this was called question one. Prior to question one, Massachusetts Fish and Wildlife managed their, their wildlife populations through education, similar to every other state agency, research and regulated um, seasons, and in some cases, bag limits. Uh, they were harvesting anywhere from eight to 10% of their beaver on an annual basis, which was maintaining their population between about 25 and 30,000 beaver, which was about where they wanted it. And they were collecting data on these harvested animals um, on an annual basis. Question one passed, which banned um, foothold traps, body gripping traps, and allowed the use of cage traps. Uh, I will say that uh, the trap in the middle there is um, a fairly dangerous trap. I, if, you catch your, if you caught your arm in that, it could break your arm. I know one trapper that actually got hit in the face with it and it almost took his nose off. So, you know, you're, you're making a trade off there. And uh, actually the, the, the body gripping mousetrap was also legal, um, maintained legal. So prior to question one, they were harvesting about 1,100 beaver. And the first year after the ban, they harvested 98. Resulted in an increasing population. Um, and along with that increasing population, so by about 1999, they had about 50,000 beaver. And by 2001, they had about 70,000 beaver. Their population had basically doubled. And along with the increase in the population, the complaints from the public went up as well. And in response, um, the legislature gave the authority to the municipalities to give out uh, permits to trap after the damage that actually occurred. So if you had flooding and you had tried to uh, address that flooding through other means and you couldn't, you could apply to the municipality for a permit to trap beaver using the outlawed body gripping trap. And you can see from this graph, um, by 2005 and six, uh, more beaver were being taken with the outlawed body gripping trap than, and through this, this permitting system than were, be taking, were being taken through the, the regulated trapping season. Um, and a lot of these were being taken out of season and being wasted. Um, so although people were hoping to minimize harvest of animals through trapping, it actually resulted in just the opposite. And, and they basically continued to trap beaver with the trap that had been outlawed. So after 1996, um, more beaver, instead of being used as a valuable resource, they were taken as nuisance animals, which is something that we 
we really um, are concerned about. We don't want people thinking of these animals as nuisance animals. They're, they're valuable animals. Beaver create their keystone species. They create really critical habitat with the wetlands that they create. And we want people to value those animals and they, they don't value them after they start to become a problem. So 76% of the beaver be taking, are being taken under this emergency permit. Almost all of them with the outlawed um, got body gripping trap. Most of those are 54% are taken outside the regular season, which means they're not being utilized in general. Um, again, almost all of them with the body gripping trap. And what saddens me the most is that the municipalities can also give out permits, or I don't, I'm not even sure that the landowner needs a permit to destroy the dam. And so many of these valuable wetland habitats are, are being eliminated because there's no alternative to living with the wetland. And they certainly have a beaver baffle program, but it's, it just can't work in every place. So they lost this valuable wildlife management tool. They can't access the data anymore. The, there's no, no requirement um, that municipalities actually um, turn in any information about how many permits they give out because it, it would be a burden on the municipalities, obviously. So there's no centralized location for data. High cost to the town and the public. Towns now have to pay to take care of the beaver. Trappers are charging upwards of $300 for beaver to trap the beaver um, because they're often being taken out of season. Um, and so the costs to towns are anywhere from $4,000 to $21,000 on an annual basis. Loss of wetlands, increase in illegal activity um, by both the landowner and, and trappers, um, and that the ban trap is actually permissible when human safety is at risk. The carcass is wasted. Um, and so the fur harvester can't use the band trap, but it can be used in nuisance situations. So the, the access to the meat and the pelt are, are basically gone in many cases. Um, so we actually have a, um, a beaver management program here that includes the installation of beaver baffles. Uh, we have a, for 20 years, I've had a technician, we've put installed upwards of 300 beaver baffles um, where we, we work with landowners, with towns, to put these in to lower the water level so that um, landowners can live or town road, town road foremans can live with the wetland at a lower level. And it, it works quite well, although it doesn't work 100% of the time. It probably works about 60% of the time. And there are just cases where managing that population, that beaver population in those wetlands has to be part of the solution. It just, it just has to be because the baffle doesn't always work. Some of these beaver are smarter than we are. <laughs> um, so we have, to, we have to employ something besides just the, the non-invasive techniques. So the critical thing here is that, um, and, and, I, and listening to your conversation before, we grappled with the same things you were talking about. We're responsible for serving all publics. So everybody from bird watchers to landowners to hunters and trappers to people who like to hike to people who like to canoe. And that's a challenge um, for people in your position and people in our position, because it's how do you how do you take that pie and cut it up equally so that everybody has access to the resources that they care about and that they have interest in and hunters and trappers have been um, having access to these resources for generations. And really what it's about is figuring out how to share with everybody else. And, and our responsibility is to make sure that we don't take so many animals that other people who want to know they're out there for just intrinsic reasons or want to be able to see them on the landscape or see sign of them to make sure that they don't, that they still can have access to those animals. And so that's the, that's the juggling act that we go through. It sounds like it's the juggling act that you will be going through on the lands that you're responsible for in town. It's, it's very similar. Um, so we try to get people to work together on the real threats to wildlife, habitat loss and fragmentation, climate change, uh, which is a big one, and um, how to address these human wildlife conflicts as we find people moving further and further into these wildlife habitat areas. Um, and we're gonna have more and more conflicts going forward. 
So we try to build bridges as much as we can. It's very challenging, um, especially challenging with social media because these kinds of discussion, these kinds of things require in-depth discussion and, and not just sound bites. Um, and polarizing people uh, is a real, I think it's a real concern and real threat to the future of conservation uh, when these people get polarized. We all have an impact on wildlife. Whether we, you know, whether we have an outdoor cat, whether we drive a car, whether we live in a house, um, whether we wear cotton, we all have an impact on wildlife. And working together to try to minimize those impacts, I think, is really where we need to go in the future. Um, so I leave you with a quote from Aldo Leopold. My, um, my sort of guiding compass is that anything that gets people outside and connected to the out of doors, I think, has benefits to wildlife, as long as we're not doing something that impacts them in the long term. And um, that's our bottom line is what's in the best interest of this resource and what does science say is in the best interest of this resource. And that's how we try to make our decisions. And we change as science changes. So thank you very much. I really appreciate the time. <clears throat> thank you, Kim. <clears throat> I'm sure there's other questions to be asked. but. Um, what? Talk a little bit about the trapping laws uh, in Vermont, and it's my understanding that we are not uh, able to ban or outlaw trapping in general in the town. That's my understanding. And so, legal legal trapping then uh, on is can continue to happen. But what are what are the um, Maybe you've covered it already, but what are the uh, most common uh, animals that are trapped in Vermont? Um, beaver, probably muskrat, uh, raccoon, fox. I would say those are probably the top four. Is that for the pelts? Yeah. Yes. And 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 mm -hmm. a lot of people eat, like a lot of people eat beaver or use it for use the castor glands. Um, they may actually use the meat for other things, like like to feed their their dogs. <clears throat> we, we've actually used beaver to feed Martin. There are um, wild game dinners around the state right. that uh, serve a variety of things. So. Right. Other questions from the board? Or is there still a market for pelts? Uh, there's a market. It's pretty low right now, and COVID pretty not pretty much knocked the heck out of the Canadian market um, just because they, they, you know, they were social distancing. They basically closed, as far as I know, they closed uh, the ability to, to go up there and sell. So for the last couple of years, it's been pretty low. Um, and what, what, and I'm not asking for specific, you know, line by line, but how, what, what are, what is the regulation for trapping and getting a trapping license. Let me let me ask more specifically and then ask you to go general. Um, is it legal to trap without a license in the state of Vermont? No. Um, are there exceptions for ages or anything like that? Uh, yes, there's an exception for the age. I actually would have to look up what okay. that age is. Like if you're younger than a certain age, right. you don't need. Yeah. OK. Um, is that does that mean that people who are younger than a certain age don't have to go through the um, process to uh, the educational process to get a permit uh, to get a you know, to get a license. Mm. Wait, um, you know, I, I I I I'd have to check on that and be sure. I don't want to I don't want to give you the wrong answer. So I will I will look that up. If you could, yeah. um, okay. And then um, what what is required to get a license? Excuse me. What is required to get a license for a driver's you, license? You, you need have to pass to. a written test and do an exam, a driver's test. And... Yeah, you have to take a, a course, a trapper ed course, a trapper education course, and then take a test and pass the test. Okay. And the the education course, what I mean, does it cover a lot of the stuff that you're at your thing? Um, tonight? it 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 covers. There's a there's a whole book of with with a variety of chapters on. You know, there's BMP chapters, there's chapters on safety, there's chapters on um, ethics and landowner, uh, you know, how you, the, some of the laws and um, how you behave. There's chapters on actually how to do it. Uh, there's, there's often a field portion of it. 
prior to COVID, there was generally some kind of field portion with it where you'd go out and have some hands-on work. Um, so it's just, it's, it's, it's about a six or eight hour course usually. And I, I um, as you can probably tell from how I'm dressed, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> uh, and I came right from work. Um, but I, I actually don't have a private practice anymore, but I did uh, for a very long time, and I actually did uh, uh, fish and wildlife criminal defense. Wow. Um, and, uh, uh, so I know, I know that taking big game out of season is a crime. Mm -hmm. I know that transporting big game out of season is a crime. Is are there criminal penalties associated with uh, illegally trapping, or is it just a civil fine? Oh, see again, like I would have to ask a warden. You might know better than me what what's criminal versus civil. Um, My clients were all deer jaggers, so. <laughs> oh, they were all what? Deer jaggers. Oh, they were. Oh, okay. Yeah, which I think is a unique Vermont term. I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. That. Most of these people didn't have driveways, they had door yards. The colonel asked me if, I, if a warden should come, and I said, I, I don't think so, but I probably should have had one here. They, they are the ones that really, they know the laws. And I, well, I, I do know that wardens take their jobs very seriously. They do, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, and, and actually, the, um, are there, are, do you know of any towns in the state of Vermont that have banned trapping on town land? Um, I know that, um, that the town of um, the next town down is uh, Richmond. Richmond. I think they're grappling with the same thing. I don't know what they ended up deciding to do. Okay. Um, there are towns that around here that that are still allowing it, but I I and don't know who has banned it at this point. Hey, um, my questions um, are going to focus on some comments we received about trapping, mm -hmm. mostly from folks who are not in favor of the town allowing trapping. Uh, one is the, the pain it causes to the animals. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the um, um, that it whatever captures uh, non-targeted species. I, I know you addressed that a little bit. I'm curious how that data, uh, you believe it applies to Vermont. Um, and then the third is uh, alternative methods. Uh, there are other, other alternative methods to controlling, um, I guess, nuisance animals as opposed to trapping. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping you can address all three of those. Okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Okay, thank um, you. So the first one was um, just go pain. Back. The the pain, yeah. yeah. Uh, and and that's really a difficult thing to measure. The goal of the best management practices was to try to minimize pain and suffering. The foothold trap is a, a trap that holds the foot, not the leg, but the foot. And um, with the lamination and or um, the, the, the um, offset jaw, which is like a gap in the jaws, or padded, um, the, the hope is that there is less if any pain and suffering, um, I mean, I, I I have put my hand in a trap with a mint, with a glove on, a leather glove, um, and you know it's it's not comfortable. I wouldn't want to spend a lot of time in it, but it it's not, you know, for for a foot like a, a dog or a bobcat, it's hard for me to say. I don't know, but you know, those were the standards that were developed by um, the international committee, and those were the standards that. We had those animals necropsied by veterinarians, and they were blind necropsies. We sent the animals that had been tested to centralized areas where they did blind necropsies to determine lacerations, to determine uh, any, any broken bones, uh, any chewing. And the traps that passed were the traps that had a minimal amount of those kinds of things. So um, that that's, you know, that's, that's the, that's the science behind it, and that's the best that I know um, for in terms of animal welfare. Uh, it's, it, they're designed, those traps, the foothold traps, are designed to be holding devices. Um, and you can't capture a canid like a, a coyote easily, if at all, in a box trap or any other trap. So that's why I was referring to Massachusetts, where they have these situations where they've ac actually had people being bitten by coyotes in suburban areas where they become habituated, 
and they they can't discharge firearms and they can't use straps and so they have no way of really dealing with these animals that um you know are habituated and 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 not afraid of people anymore so that's that's the animal welfare question the second one was um well, I think you, you hit two of them because one of them was about are there alternatives? Oh. And, and what I just heard you say, if you don't mind me repeating it back to you, is right. that in some cases, no, there yeah. aren't. In some cases, there very well might be, but in some cases, no. Right. And then the third one was uh, trapping of non-targeted species. Yeah. And I will say that by alternatives, there, there, are, there are alternatives to, if you have a coyote, if you're trying to protect your sheep from coyote predation, there are husbandry practices that you can imp implement that will minimize the chances. There's dogs, there's fencing, all sorts of things that you can try. And we recommend all of those things before we recommend that somebody actually try to eliminate the animal. But if the animal figures out that sheep are easy pickings, um, you're not probably gonna change that behavior. And then your only alternative is probably gonna be to remove that animal. So there's alternatives almost all the time to the removal of the animal through any means, trapping or hunting or whatever. Um, but if those, if those alternatives are exhausted, and, and then, then that's, there's nothing else you can do, um, in my opinion. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I, I think it's important to stress that alternatives exist, but they're not 100% effective. Okay. Um, and the last one, I'm sorry, the last one again. <laughs> targeting, uh, trapping, non targets, targets non -targets. Non -targets. yes. Yeah. Yes, and, and so we participated in that national research. We, uh, we tested traps for coyotes in Vermont. We tested traps for Fisher in Vermont uh, for 10, upwards of 10 years, I, I believe. Um, and I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't think that there was any incidence of mortality to domestic animals through our, I'd have to go back and look specifically at that data, but I don't think so. We've also done um, a veterinary survey. Um, we sent out surveys to all the vets in Vermont. And um, what, we, what we got back, we did it, we've done it twice now. We repeated it, I think maybe 20 years ago and, and in the last five years. And um, over about 315,000 trap nights, we had a, an average of about six animals, six domestic dogs or cats trapped um, per year. So it happens. Um, not always by people who are trapping legally or using the kind of devices that they should be using, but it does happen. Okay. Um, and also um, capturing whatever trapping not domestic, but non-domestic, but not targeted animals? Mm -hmm. Is that a fair question? Sure, it's a yeah. fair question. Um, and as with everything, I would never say never. It, it, it happens. I think it's at, at relatively low amounts um, because that's not the interest of the trapper either. And they can, put, they can set their trap, they can set the pan tension in the trap um, to try to minimize the take of raptors or birds or things like that. Um, if they're targeting a heavier animal, they set the pan tension um, so that, that it takes a lot more pressure to push that pan down. And that's the goal. That's how you get selectivity. It's by where you set the trap and how you set that pan tension. Yeah, okay. And, and this is just a comment is, um, one of the incidences that led to there being opposi opposition to trapping in Williston was a particularly gruesome one mm -hmm. um, where I don't know the details, but my recollection is the animal died and apparently died in a very unhumane manner. Hmm. Um, yeah, and though that's, that is inappropriate. That, you know, that shouldn't happen. It shouldn't have to happen and it shouldn't happen. And um, we would not support that kind of use of, of the of these these devices. Um, okay. I'm not sure I, it, the details would be helpful to know, um, but and I'm not suggesting you tell that. me yeah. here. But yeah. um, it's hard for me to comment on it. But 
our goal is to educate these people to do this in as humane a way as possible, in as responsible a way as possible, and as ethical a way as possible, um, to um, make sure that these animals don't suffer. That's the goal. Okay, good, thank you. Sure. So I've had two requests for people to publicly comment regarding um, the issue tonight, but before we go on to that, or is there anyone in the audience who any, has any specific questions for, for Kim? Yes. Please identify yourself. Sure. Take your mask off so I can hear you. And I just want to know how, I mean, how much suffering is tolerable? And it just seems like we can allow a little bit or as we have found it can be the extreme there is nobody in the woods to look at the suffering this was just an opportunity that my neighbor had to witness it is it the only time it happened that would be foolish to think so how much suffering and you know and we're not talking about private there's not, this is town land. It's my land, it's your land. I can't tolerate any undue And there are alternatives. And one of the major ones that wasn't even brought up is how we design development. Like I lived in old stage estates, it was way too close to the beaver habitat. So we can eliminate nuisance animals by not putting humans in the opportunity that they are infringing on the natural habitats. And uh, in that time I lived there, there were less beavers because every time it started a dam, the beavers left. And there is no humane way, there's no way to minimize that in the capture of some animals. And it, a lot of information was presented about like the whole world, and, you know, in numbers, but national numbers, which is, we should, we should just stick to our town. This is our land. These are the animals that we deal with. This is what the population that is comfortable for is left for the same. I'm going to say I didn't be here to just express that the incredible anguish that I have known that there could be animals as I go to bed in a train. And there wasn't even mention of this before. Put yourself in a train and have, have, have other parts of your pack or you know, family because these gentlemen are loner animals. The suffering is not acceptable. Think, think about it with human children. Is a little bit of suffering okay? Do we just get upset when there is like, okay, we're going to tolerate this much suffering and then it's fine. If it's town land, any suffering that we can eliminate, I can see that the effects can be. Uh, so thanks. But looking for questions for Kim uh, to and her expertise. We'll have a chance at another meeting to talk about. Well, then the question is, what address does that work? When an animal is trapped, does it just lie down? In some cases, it it might. Um, we actually the only thing I can I can tell you is that with the bobcat study that we did and the coyote study that we did in the in the 80s and in the 2000s we used the foothold trap the same trap that trappers use today only actually well it, we used bmtp traps for the, the bobcat study um and we came the next day and they have to be tra checked on a daily basis trappers have to do that as well we, um, we then put a collar around these animals and followed them for up to three to four months after they had been held in the foothold trap overnight. Um, we got a lot of information about 
the habitats that they used. I think we might have had some cats in Williston that we followed around. Um, and we did not see any evidence of disruption in the way they moved across the landscape or I, I can't speak to psychological impacts because that's, that's just not a science that we have a lot of information. But I appreciate your your concern and we have similar concerns and are have that's why we put um, our efforts into trying to improve the systems so that it, it minimizes. We these tools are used across the country for research. Um, and we for reintroductions, we use the same foothold trap that trappers use to trap otter and reintroduce them into Missouri. Um, and they 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 seemingly were released and, and lived a happy life in Missouri after they were trapped with a foothold trap. I mean, I you know, that's the best I know. I don't it have it. doesn't sound like that though again. We should stick to Williston in the town land. Right. And and you mentioned, you know, the coyote, there's nothing you can do. Well, you know, when you talk about you can't do firearms at some other place, it, it's confusing when we're talking about other places. It'd be nice if you could talk about what flies to us. And I do know there's darts. I don't think you have to necessarily put a bullet in an animal. You need to get them into a, a place that's better for all involved. Um, it, it, there's live traps, there's darts, there's other means to handle wildlife in respect of their life. And we know now the science in animals, we are one. And there's a lot of videos you can search. It, it doesn't take a, a, a real bright brain to watch animal response in a trap being highly stressed. I, I do appreciate your comment about respect because I think that's critical is that everybody it's one of the things that we talk about respecting these animals is is critical to whether you're utilizing them for food um, or or whether you're just out enjoying them respecting them is really critical and I think that's that you're you're exactly correct about that. I'd like to now to go to uh... Two people have requested a uh, quick question. Yeah, um, quick question. Um, so you talked about um, mm -hmm. the So I'm wondering when we look around, which land is now built, which land used to be wild? So do you talk to the town about maybe not building so much and saving some of that land? I mean, you, you talk about how right it is, mm -hmm. and yet all of our land is being built mm -hmm. and it's forcing these animals into other locations. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do you ever give comments to the town about what we could be doing and how we shouldn't be building so much and saving land for the animals? Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, if they ask us, we're there. We actually have a person who's dedicated to meeting with towns and working with them on their town plans. We have we have booklets on how to incorporate zoning language into your town plan. Uh, we have we have a lot of materials that are, are available to towns who want to look at we um, look at the big picture and and how to sort of manage uh, development to try to minimize the impact on our life. Understanding too, because I'm from the north, this trapper filmed this animal trapped. He posted it on YouTube or wherever. And actually, another trapper was so offended by this video that he contacted the board. Mm -hmm. So, when you talk about it not being a painful experience, maybe you shouldn't look at that video. I did not have the desire to. 
Yeah. But if, 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 if another chapter calls out another chapter, it must have increased. Yeah, and I, I don't I don't want to suggest that there can't be situations where it is inhumane. Um, and it sounds like this case was. I think there's ways to do it, and that's what's taught in our trapper education courses. I think there's ways to do it that minimizes that. And, and then, but I guess then we're counting on the person to do We right are. We're and they're not all going to do the same. Right. And I do agree with this here. I think we're not talking about banning trapping. We're talking about protecting our town land. We are all owners of this land. And I think when I talked to Eric, he had said that that person that called up and said, can I put a trap on the town land? I think the town would have said no, if I'm understanding. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I believe that's kind of what you would have said to me. So I think it's not unreasonable to say we respect the animal population. It is being pushed out of all their areas and not allow this type of trap or trapping. I can see if the town has an issue with beavers or whatever, we may have to do something. But to allow trapping for the general population on our own property, I think we could do that. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you saying that um, not everybody, as with as with most of our laws, um, there's people who don't follow them. And that's the role of our, our law enforcement folks to make sure that that people are out there doing the right thing. Um, and, and do people slip through the tracks? Clearly, it sounds like this person um, didn't, but he got caught, and I'm thankful that he got caught. Well, again, we can't do that because we didn't work shooting. Yeah, we're getting into a much too much discussion at this point. Yeah. So, sorry, I saw a hand back here. A question, no. okay. Okay, so I'm going to move on then to uh, the two folks who asked for public comment. Jim McCullough, would you like to come up to the microphone over here? I'm limited to this no no more than five minutes. Uh, thank you, select board and 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 uh, town manager, uh, for your service, your time, your effort um, on this and all topics that fill your fill not just your meeting time here, but your waking hours the other other six days um, and some of your not waking hours i'm sure i want to thank uh, kim royer for coming and for the uh department of fish and wildlife's work managing um their mission which um as i understood kim to say was managing the wildlife um, and the habitat for the people of the state of Vermont, and for the habitat itself, and for the for the animals themselves, and and they work very very hard at that. Uh, we got a lot of information tonight um, from Kim uh, about stuff uh, uh, w with data from around the country and around the world, um, and and the, um, the the department uses data and uses science. And, and I understand that. And I'm not here to debate um, the, the, what Kim has said today, uh, this evening, but only to suggest to you that the, the um, management of the wildlife that, that um, was mentioned tonight uh, Coyotes could bite people. That's a scare tactic, excuse me. And it um, is really out of the realm of uh, this discussion, I believe. Um, and further, um, Kim Royer and others in the department have said in my committee, now I've been Fish, Wildlife, Natural Resources for uh, 17 years so far, and I have never heard that from the department that um, trapping coyote would um, protect people 
in fact, trapping coyote and shooting coyote only increases their populations because they are very clever and they know what they're doing. And that's a testimony we've actually gotten multiple times through the years. And, and why are we having to manage beaver and muskrat? Again, in all those years, um, in, uh, in my fish and wildlife experience, um, the department has never mentioned that we're being overrun by beaver and muskrat and, and that the habitat is getting ruined and we need to control that much less uh, extolling the virtues of trapping. The data that um, we, we've got lots of data tonight, and I'll just leave you with this thought about data. And first, let me say, I think Williston and Williston's residents are a pretty good cross section of the state of Vermont. That's just an assumption. The University of Vermont did a survey of Vermonters about trapping. 75% responded to the University of Vermont survey saying we don't want trapping. The very data oriented Department of Fish and Wildlife disallowed that survey. It was somehow flawed. i just leave you with that thought. I thank you for your time. So, Jim, are you saying that Fish and Wildlife is biased? I did not say that. Well, you, you said that they tried to scare us, and you said they dismissed a, a, a poll. So I'm wondering if, if that's not your point, what is your point? My point is that... Um, that they are biased. I did not say that. They are biased. Are. They are. And they are biased for an ever-shrinking population in Vermont that traps. Okay. Um, and I would not have said that freely. You, you imply it. But I'm responding to your specific yeah, I, I, this question. Is my, the reason I'm asking that question is, and I'm sorry that I'm getting upset, but... Um, I know that this is a heated topic for people. What I don't like is the stuff that happens in national politics where you say, I'm just asking questions. But the questions imply that somebody's biased. You have had the honor to admit that that was the implication that you were making. But I, I, don't, I don't enjoy this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> Moving on to... Uh... Person with she on the line. Yeah, I have two folks on online, Terry, uh, Brenna from Protect Our Wildlife, yes. and Peggy Larson, and then Lynn in the room. Um, so we'd like to go to someone on online oh. next. Um, I'll go to Brenna um, from Protect Our Wildlife. Brenna, I'm going to connect to you, be able to share your audio just just a moment. Hi, Brenna, can you hear me? Hi, Eric, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, yes. yep. you're on with the select board. You have okay. up to five minutes. Yes, I, I timed myself out of uh, consideration <laughs> and respect for your for your limited uh, availability tonight. So I just, I do want to thank you for the opportunity to, for me to provide uh, a brief public comment, uh, and it is under five minutes, on behalf of our Williston members uh, concerning the petition to prohibit trapping on town-owned land. Um, we are, to no surprise, very much in support of the petition um, because it'll prohibit the use of steel jawed leg hold and body gripping conibear kill traps, uh, thereby making it safer for not only wildlife, but also people's pets. Um, I, I do look forward to the opportunity to present a different perspective from Vermont Fish and Wildlife at a future meeting where our Williston members can attend. Um, it is important to mention that state fish and wildlife agencies across the country are tasked with promoting trapping. So a different perspective, such as ours, will hopefully help the select board make an even more informed decision. 
So I just want to talk briefly about Massachusetts because we view the Massachusetts trapping ban as being a huge success. Um, and the people that I speak with quite frequently from Massachusetts are very proud to be in a state that embraces 21st century wildlife management solutions and also elevated ethics. Um, unfortunately, we hear a lot of scare tactics uh, shared by pro-trapping pro -trapping advocates about the Massachusetts ban, but the trapping ban has been a resounding success. We're looking at countless bobcats and river otters and gray fox and other wildlife who are no longer recreationally trapped. This means greater biodiversity, less non-targeted animals like bald eagles getting trapped, and also a more targeted trapping approach where only those beavers that are causing damage are trapped and killed. But most beavers cause no problems at all and are, are actually considered a keystone species for their ecological services. And Colorado, Arizona, and eight other states have also banned trapping. Um, I wanted to quickly refer to the January 28th memorandum to the select board. Um, and I'm hoping that this might be helpful. Um, so a concern, there was three different concerns that were raised. One concern was that trapping an animal as a nuisance under emergency conditions rather than during a regulated season usually results in less control over the types of devices used. Um, that is not relevant in Vermont. The type of trap uh, would not be limited in those situations here in Vermont that was specific to Massachusetts. Uh, another concern was there'd be a cost to the town. Um, there would likely always be a cost to the town to address an imminent um, situation that would be handled by a nuisance wildlife trapper. Um, but these cases are rare. And the last concern was that the pelt would be wasted uh, if not trapped during the legal trapping season. Um, pelts are not used now at all. I mean, beaver pelts especially um, are not selling. Probably the only pelt that's selling on the market would be coyote pelts and at a very, very low um, price. Uh, beaver caster can be used year round. So trapping and killing the animal as a quote unquote nuisance out of season, that animal would not go to waste. And again, you'd only be killing those beavers who are causing problems, not just randomly killing beavers, you know, in the town forest who are causing no problems at all. Um, you will also hear trapping advocates talk about best management practices. But um, it's important to remember that those best management practices are merely recommendations and they're not required. And the department has very little knowledge as to who's actually using these BMPs. They're completely voluntary. And I would suspect that the activity uh, that was portrayed by the coyote trapper in Williston um, was probably legal. I, I don't have the details on that, but, um, and, and I say that because in Vermont, um, some trappers use leghole traps that have been remained unchanged for a hundred years. We don't have toothed leghole traps anymore, but a lot of the other traps that are used slam shut with tremendous force. Um, trappers may set unlimited traps and there are no limits on the number of animals that may be trapped. And there are also no requirements as to how an animal must be killed. So common methods of killing a trapped animal uh, are bludgeoning, strangling, drowning, this isn't hyperbole, this is legal methods of killing trapped animals in Vermont and they're used by trappers. Um, so in closing, I, I hope that no one here who is out recreating is unfortunate enough to come across a terrified animal in pain struggling in a lake hole trap. And here's a great chance to prevent that from happening while still protecting your infrastructure and uh, elevating ethics around recreational uses. Thank you for the time. I, I do appreciate it. Thank you. I think I saw a few hands for, I'm not sure whether there are questions or comments. Uh, gentleman in the back. Did you have your hand up before? Oh, yeah. um, I'm interested in finding out if there's an articulation of the wildlife management policy across the state in rural towns versus urban versus urbanizing towns. It seems to be a chronic need that 
for a creation and articulation of policy that recognizes the rural urban character of the town in which the animals are living. Grant, yeah, I, I, I don't, in, in terms of policy for town, Policies related to traffic or policies related to wildlife management or nuisance? Wildlife management. This would include traffic. Yeah. Um, well, actually, a good portion of Vermont is still pretty rural. Um, so we still look at most of Vermont as being a rural state. Um, we don't have the problems that Massachusetts has yet at this point in terms of human wildlife conflicts the 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 coyote human issues that they had in that what my question is directed at on fish and wildlife I, I guess i don't understand your question do you think that preserving habitat nuisance is the oh. same level of protection as stand oh you're asking me in terms of habitat yeah, uh, yeah, sure. There's habitat we, protection. We have management of wildlife. Yeah, so we have developed something called Vermont Conservation Design. It's a map that identifies large forest blocks of rural habitat. That if we want to maintain wildlife going into the future, we need to maintain those large forest blocks and the connected corridors that keep them linked together across from, from the northern part of the state to the southern part of the state. So fragmented habitats are not going to come out as high on that map in terms of things that really need to be protected for, for future wildlife uh, sustainability as those large forest blocks. The, the Green Mountain National Forest are key areas and then spreading out from there. Uh, so certainly, yes, there's, there's, a, there's a difference in how you might look at habitat protection in the town of Burlington, in the city of Burlington, versus uh, you know the town of Chittenden or something. Right. Yeah, for sure. You're exactly right. <laughs> that doesn't mean that the people of Chittenden might have um, habitat, have a have an endangered habitat that they want to try to protect, or or an active community that they want to try to protect. Um, but that's that's different. I guess I'm saying that, that it would be, I think, appropriate to have a policy that has greater the specificity in development and development areas, mm -hmm. where the opportunities for maintaining habitat are close to nil, mm -hmm. as opposed to much of the state of the world that there are tens, if not hundreds of thousands of Areas, and that's where I think it appears that there needs to be some more articulation of fish and wildlife policy. Yeah, and, and I just keep in mind that it's really the towns that make those decisions in most most cases. I mean, we, we have some authority through Act 250, but the towns are making those decisions um, on, on where and how they want to develop, for example. We have guidance documents, we have recommendations, but the towns I'll uh, make those decisions in general. Fish and wildlife regulates traffic. Yeah. The town does. Right. But I thought you were talking about habitat. Talking about well, the extent to which the animals are deemed to have as well as corridors and so on. So mm -hmm. I'm suggesting there's a conflict here that we should be looking at. Um that that's very possible, yeah. I'm not sure exactly how to do it, but <clears throat> I get your point. It's, it's, it's worth thinking about. You want to comment, uh, lady in the back? Well, I'm sorry. And I don't know what to say. Um, I think yep. Yep. Oh, okay. yep. when you're all set. So if you would demask so we can hear you. Okay. Um, Oh, 
up to five minutes. Oh, it won't be that long. Um, hi, I'm Lynn Blevins, and um, I'm the person who read the Front Porch Forum post about, um, well, from the person who happened upon the coyote. And um, it, it really touched my heart. Um, and so I did send the, a, a statement out through Front Porch Forum um, requesting that the town not allow recreational trapping on town land. Mm -hmm. And very quickly got 280 signatures. And I'm sure that we could get more. Um, and I just, I wanna be clear that what we're asking for is for the town to not allow permission for recreational trapping on town land. Of course, this doesn't say, we can't say anything about private land or state land. This is only town land and only recreational trapping. So if the town needed to do, take some sort of measure for a, a demonstrated threat to infrastructure or safety, that's up to the town's discretion. We're asking for a limitation or a, to eliminate um, recreational trapping. So the town is growing. As you know, there's more and more of us every day and we have great public town lands um, and people are using them more and more, especially since COVID has started. And all the evidence shows that people will continue to use these public lands. People have sort of fallen in love with the great outdoors, which is one of the silver linings of COVID-19. So of course there's concerns to domestic pets, to children, um, but also to our mental health if we walk upon these or even if we read a, a post in Front Porch Forum about one of our neighbors who came upon an animal suffering in the trap. So I just want to be clear that um, many of the things that were, were discussed tonight don't really apply to the policy that we're, we're asking for. We're not, there aren't any invasive species to control in Williston that, that need to be trapped. There's plenty of invasive species. Um, and um, I, um, so I, I hope that we can keep our discussion in the future focused on the ask, which is um, to eliminate recreational trapping on town lands. Thanks. Thank you. So we're at the closing point for this discussion tonight. We'll be uh, discussing this further as we progress in the next month or so. And so, Kim, thanks so very much for coming tonight and sharing your, your knowledge of fish and wildlife. And yes. Appreciate you. your being here. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And I, just one last comment, I, if you'll bear with me. I, I, I want to just say that I consider myself a wildlife advocate, not a trapping advocate. Um, and have been for 40 years, and that's that's been my career, and I I I care deeply about these animals as deeply as the people in this room do. Um, so I appreciate your time, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Harry, I had one more person who wanted to comment online. Do you oh, want okay. to take a comment or have them submit it right? All right. <clears throat> uh, Peggy, I'm going to get you connected just a moment. Can I leave? Do I leave the meeting, Eric? Um, the Zoom, or should yeah, I? Yeah, you can leave the Zoom. Lean zoom. Yep, okay. it'll keep it going. Okay. Thanks for checking. And Peggy, you should be connected. You'll see to unmute. Oh, yes, I've done this before. <laughs> okay, we hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Clark, Peggy. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for letting me put my two cents worth in here. I've attended a lot of these fish and wildlife board meetings and I never see anybody on there except people that are hunters, trappers, and fishermen. The general public, which makes up about 78% um, of the non-hunters and the non-trappers is not represented on the board. And I think what I would like to see is I would like to see some changes in the board where the rest of us are represented so that we do have a voice in uh, you know, uh, establishing some of these uh, uh, protocols. So that's the first thing that came to mind uh, when you asked me to speak. 
Okay, I'm a veterinarian. My master's degree is in pathology and I'm also a lawyer, Mr. Kennedy. So we're kind of on the same page. And um, I have seen many animals caught, dogs and cats caught in these traps. The worst one I saw was in Heinsberg and that poor little cat must have been in there three or four or five days. She was so dehydrated that her eyes were sunken in and the hair was, you could pull her hair up and it would stay that way. Broken leg, badly infected, terrible pain. I couldn't save her. But anybody who thinks that these animals that are caught in traps don't feel pain isn't using their heads or they're, they're, they're not looking at reality. Um, trapping is an extremely painful way to catch these animals. And many times the, uh, the trappers don't check their traps as often as they should. Uh, a friend of mine who was also a lawyer uh, lives in Middlebury and he found a big white owl in a trap. And by the time you know he found it, it was all disintegrated. It had been in that trap for probably a couple of weeks. Nobody had bothered to check the trap. And I think what uh, Ms. Royer was saying is, uh, is um, the ideal. And what I hear and what I see are two different things. I think that are a lot of these ideals of hers are not being followed out there. Um, so anyway, uh, another thing that that is kind of disturbing to me and you can see it on Facebook where these trappers will record their methods of killing these animals. They will catch these animals in a trap and then they'll yell at it or scream at it or something. And the way they kill it is with a whopping stick. Instead of taking and shooting that animal and just putting a bullet through its head, they beat it to death. Um, so they terrified, the animal is terrified. It's in pain from its foot being trapped and then it's beaten to death. There was a trapper in Maine who finally went the other direction was trapping and he confessed to killing 28 cats in a trap. And he said that a lawyer, uh, I'm sorry, a game warden had suggested to him to kill any cat that's in his trap because if the owners find out about it and take it to a veterinarian, then it will reflect on the trapping is industry. So there's a lot of things out there that I could refute that Ms. Royer had said, but I'm not gonna keep you folks up all night. And, um, I would just like to say thank you for listening to all of us. And I hope that, uh, you know, as, as you continue to discuss that, you will invite some of us back who have the experience uh, with, with trapping. And by the way, I used to be a trapper. I used to trap muskrat. Uh, thank you again. <clears throat> Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks again, uh, Kim. Thank well, you. Thanks well, a lot. We'll I'll leave you um, some material from the association. Good. Liz, can I ask you just one question? It's sure. come up a couple of times, the concept of not checking traps. Is there a requirement or a best management practices that addresses when a trap needs to be checked? A land trap needs to be checked daily, um, an underwater trap or under ice trap every three days. Okay, thank you. Yes. Kim, do you have two more copies of that book? Please? Excuse me? Do you have another copy of that book? Oh, yeah, I have two more. Okay. Good, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Good luck. If I can offer, if you need anything else, let me know. Thank you. We'll do. Uh, I'll we're try next... to follow up on some of the questions. Yeah, I thank think. you. If you uh, email Eric with the answers to the questions, that would be Oh, that would be yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. If I hope you yeah. took notes, yeah. maybe I'll yeah. forget them. Yeah. Thank you. And thank Eric, you. you have the PowerPoint? Um, I can. I can. I'll send it to you, Eric. Okay. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to the Catamount Community Forest Stewardship Fund. And then Belinda is going to talk about uh, this and the memo that she prepared uh, for us and the, uh, the policy and approval procedure. Welcome, Melinda. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so the Catamount Community Forest uh, Committee has been working on drafting a policy for uh, considering the use of the stewardship fund that the town received um, in conjunction with the acquisition of the Catamount Community Forest. Um, some uh, $20,000 of funds raised were put into a stewardship fund um, for the property and with the intention of um, using those funds for either trail stewardship, maintenance, or um, other land stewardship activities. Uh, so 
the policy, um, basically there's, there's a statement that sa says that it's the intention to maintain at least $10,000 in the fund just for in case of emergency measures like um, a storm where you have an, a, a bunch of blowdowns that need to be removed or something like that. But essentially, um, the idea was to put into um, put into place a policy for consideration of how the funds would be used. So, um, I I basically put all of you know the bullet points um, in the management plan about um, how the property should be managed um, generally and with relation to uh, natural resource goals, wildlife habitat, rec recreation, educational and cultural goals. And just, you know, the policy, this policy in intends to take those goals into consideration when deciding how to spend those funds. Um, it also outlines a process by which um, to award uh, funding to, you know, I guess, the catamount committee could propose um expenditure for, for of the funds for a reason um the outdoor center could come up with a proposal uh i guess any members of the public could come up with a proposal for use of the funds um or for some of the funds and and so the policy lists a number of questions to consider um with how the any proposal aligns with the goals um of the management plan and the town goals for that property um and ju and just a uh procedure by which um approval could be granted um ending with um consideration of this the way um there is a policy for the use of the environmental reserve fund and it's sort of modeled after that policy it's similar in nature um so if you have any questions i'm happy to answer them Mm -hmm. Any questions for Melinda? Um, unless it looks like we're clear, but it gives the select board uh, the uh, the last say on the spending of the funds. Yeah, I, I've read this in detail, and I have nothing to compliment. But this is good, well done. Yeah. Melinda wrote it. <laughs> well, well, the committee had lots of <laughs> uh, you're here there, there, but <laughs> <laughs> well. It's, Good job. It's yeah. We do have a suggested motion. Uh, well, before we well, never mind. I'll motion to make. Uh, I'd move to adopt the Catamount Community Forest Stewardship Fund priority policy and approval procedures as presented. First thing I'll do is I'll second that. So I have a motion made and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? The discussion I'd like to have is I am both a member of the you know committee that this falls on as well as on the select board. Is there a reason why I should okay, good, thank you. I didn't have to even finish what I was saying and they're like, no. <laughs> well, uh, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Three eyes has it. And uh, no, thank you, Melinda. Yeah. Nice job. Um, moving on to manager's report. I'll be really brief. I've got um, just a couple of quick items in addition to my report this evening. Good update on the ARPA funding. Um, that's the, uh, the county allocation money was a bit in limbo the last couple of months, and then we found out um, late in July that that authorization for the additional ARPA funds um, that would go to the county are going to be passed through to municipalities in the state. Um, I don't have an exact number on that yet. Uh, one number that was floated to me earlier this year was upwards of $2 million in that pool of money. So I'll, I'll confirm with the board once I have a, a final number there, but the town may be back to receiving upwards of $3 million through ARPA. And we received our first uh, payment of about half a million dollars um, earlier or last month, rather. So um, staff will be taking a closer look at the rules and looking to bring it back to the board and have a preliminary discussion on ARPA funding, um, hopefully in the next couple of months here. Now that we don't have much money to collect yet. Just a quick question on that. Do you mind, Eric? Oh, um, go ahead. Do you expect, foresee, or advocate for there being any sort of a public process about how to 
um, how to allocate those dollars. Yeah, the LCT had a had a webinar, and um, you know certainly th that's what they advocate for. And I, I okay. would second their recommendation. Of that. Okay. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind too that we, we don't have to make a towns have to make a quick decision on this funding. Um, we have until I think at twenty twenty four to allocate and twenty twenty six to spend. So. Um, it's, there's time to take some thoughtful um, Good. Great. deliberation to it, and there's a lot of rules to keep in mind. So my hope is to outline for the select board what those buckets look like and then um, run a proposed public process by the select board and okay. hopefully have that play out um, hopefully outside of our FY23 budget yeah. process to kind of yeah. separate the buckets. So. Perfect, and thank you. And thanks. Um, the culvert replacement project's off to a good start. Um, Muddy Brook, I know we have a little more traffic over there, but I've got to inspect it with Bruce when I get a chance, but that's uh, that's yeah. off and, and underway uh, after, after a lot of uh, waiting for that project. Yeah, well, yours truly <laughs> ended up at the bridge and going, oh, shoot, <laughs> <laughs> on my bike. <laughs> and then a um, couple quick notes here. Our fire station roof replacement project's getting underway this week. Um, we've gotten our 2020 census data. We're starting to look at it. Um, statistic I'll, I'll share with you this evening of Wilson's population grew 13.9% in the last decade, which is the highest, the greatest growth rate in Chittenden County. Uh, we're now over 10,000 people. Um, I believe just added around 1,400 residents. I'll look at the exact numbers um, for okay. the board in a, in a coming report. In our local option tax report we just received, um, the end of last week, I'll get that to you for your next meeting, but good news, we've exceeded our FY21 budget by about $281,000. Looking at our last quarter, April to June, rooms and meals are starting to go back up, and we had um, additional option um, retail sales tax. So end of the year in a good position, and surely we'll, we'll relay those numbers here coming up once we take a further look at them. So all I have this evening here. Great. Uh, you'll give us a copy of that. Uh the final report or not the final report the one earlier report yes yes okay other business we have three catering permits to take up tonight yep so there are three upcoming weddings the first uh, at the ice and barn on september 4th um catering by um the great northern restaurant um it's under pine and birch llc um staff has no um, objections taking place on september 4th <coughs> At the ocean park. Looking for a motion. Move we approve. Second. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Next. Next, uh, another wedding at the ocean barn taking place on September 18th. It's uh, 35C LLC doing business as bar anecdote. Um, at the ocean barn, again, staff has no objections to, to that day. Looking for a motion again? Move, we approve. Second. Uh, discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Well, the name of the bar anecdote? Yes, yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah. They're out of Virgins. Yeah. Yeah. Through. And the last one, it's a, another wedding. It's at the, the Red Barn Gardens. Um, it's CBD Events LLC, which stands for Catering by Dale. And uh, it's a wedding October 2nd. Um, Staff has no objections to this application. I'm sorry, the location again was? Red, Red Barn. Red Barn, further Red. down. Um, yep, okay, actually on South Road, correct? Yep. Okay, thank you. Looking for a motion? Move we approve. Second. There's a discussion on the motion. Eric, you did say staff has no objection to the last one. Yep, no objection. Okay. okay. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 And that takes care of the catering permits. Is there any other business tonight? Uh, before we go into executive session, if not, then I'm looking for a motion to go into executive session. Move that we go into executive session. It's premature public knowledge regarding a labor relations agreement would clearly place the town at a substantial disadvantage. And I'd further move that we enter executive session to discuss the fire union contract negotiations under the provisions of mm -hmm. Vermont Statutes Annotated Title I, Section 313A1B, and invite Fire Chief Aaron Collette, Finance Director Shirley Goodell Lake, Lakey, and Town Manager Eric Wells to join. Second. I'll second. Uh, that's a discussion on the motion. 
If not, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 And we're in executive session and we'll get downstairs.